Hello, welcome to CS with Terry. Today we are going to start a new series discussing everything about recursion. Recursion is very common in computer programming. It refers to the method of defining functions that call themselves. Recursion can decompose a complex problem into smaller subproblems. Therefore, it is often used in conjunction with algorithms such as divide and conquer, backtracking, and dynamic programming. However, in practice, the design of recursive functions is often very tricky, because a recursive function would keep calling itself. That is, the recursive calls are nested with each other. This kind of nesting can be very confusing when we are designing recursive functions. In this series of videos, we'll gradually dive into the ins and outs of recursion and find an intuitive and general method to solve most recursion problems. In this first video of the series, let's discuss how to cultivate reverse thinking in recursion. Let's take a look at this example first, calculating n factorial. This question is simple, and we can easily solve it iteratively. First, we define a result variable and initialize it to 1. Then, iterate n times and multiply the result by i each time. The final output is the result of n factorial. Let's recall the way we think about this problem. To calculate n factorial, we definitely want to start with smaller numbers. For example, 1 factorial equals 1, 2 factorial equals 1 factorial multiplied by 2 equals 2, 3 factorial equals 2 factorial multiplied by 3 equals 6, etc. This way, you can calculate 4 factorial, 5 factorial, until n factorial. Here, we use the sequential thinking approach when designing this iterative algorithm, which derives the unknown from the known. Recursive thinking is just the opposite. It requires reverse thinking and is a backward induction from the unknown to the known. If we want to calculate 5 factorial, it would be so much easier if we had already calculated 4 factorial, and then multiply the result by 5 to get 5 factorial. But we don't know the value of 4 factorial. So we need to find the result of 3 factorial and multiply the result by 4 to get 4 factorial. We keep going backwards until we reach 0 factorial. and 0 factorial equals 1, which is very obvious. In this way, 1 factorial can be calculated, and we can fill in all the subsequent factorial results in turn. This is the reverse thinking in factorial. We start from the final desired solution, find the solution to the smaller subproblem, and use it to construct the solution to the original problem. We keep doing this step by step, until reaching the base case, where the problem is simple enough at this point, the recursive function starts to return and fills in the solutions for each of the previous layers in turn. Let's take a look at the recursive code. We define the function factorial with the goal of calculating n factorial. When n is equal to 0, return 1 directly. This is the base case. Then we recursively call the factorial function to calculate n minus 1 factorial. Multiplying it by n, use n factorial, which we will return. This is the difference between iteration and recursion. Although this recursive code is simple, it embodies the essence of recursion. Let's break it down. Generally speaking, recursion can be divided into four stages, recursive function definition, base case processing, recursive call, and constructing the final result. In the function definition stage, we need to be clear about what this function is going to do, what its input parameters are, what kind of tasks we want it to accomplish, and what its return value is. For the factorial function, its input parameter is n. We hope it can calculate n factorial and return the result. In the stage of base case processing, we have to judge when the data size is small enough such that the result is obvious. Then we can directly hard code the answer and return it. The purpose of base case processing is to make sure the recursion will not go on infinitely. In the recursive call stage, we reduce the size of the data by a little each time and call the recursive function. This way we can find the solution to the smaller subproblem. In the constructing final result stage, we can get the solution to the original problem by using the solution to the subproblem. These are the general steps to solve recursion problems. Let's look at another example, how to calculate Fibonacci numbers using iterative and recursive methods. Let's briefly explain what Fibonacci numbers are. The Fibonacci sequence starts with 0 and 1, 
where f0 equals 0 and f1 equals 1, and each of the ensuing terms is sum of the previous two. That is, fn equals fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2. Let's first look at how to calculate Fibonacci numbers iteratively. We create an array of length n plus 1. Let f0 equal 0 and f1 equal 1. Then let i iterate from 2 to n and execute fi equals fi minus 1 plus fi minus 2. When the loop ends, fn is the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence. Next, let's take a look at how to calculate Fibonacci numbers in a recursive manner. As mentioned before, recursion requires reverse thinking. We hope to start from the final solution we want, find the solutions to the subproblems, and use them to construct the solution to the original problem. In this case, we want to calculate f4. Since the calculation of f4 requires f2 and f3, we need to call the recursive function to get them. When calculating f2 recursively, it needs to calculate f0 and f1. Since f0 and f1 are the base cases, we can get the answers directly. By adding them, we can obtain the value of f2. The same is true for the recursive call to get f3, just like this. This is how we calculate f4 through recursion. Let's apply this way of thinking to implement the recursive function for Fibonacci. We first define the function Fibonacci. With parameter n, we wanted to calculate the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence and return it. Then, we have to consider the base case of the Fibonacci function. Since the Fibonacci sequence starts with 0 and 1, it returns 0 when n equals 0 and returns 1 when n equals 1. Next, we make a recursive call to compute the solutions to the subproblems, the m-1 and m-2 entries of the Fibonacci sequence. Finally, we add fm-1 and fm-2 to get fn, which is the solution to the original problem, and return it. By the way, this tree structure just happens to capture the recursive execution process. We call it a recursion tree. In future videos, we'll continue to focus on recursion trees. We have just studied two problems, both of which can be solved by iterative and recursive methods, and the iterative method seems to be more concise and elegant. Then you may wonder, why should we learn recursion? Can't we just stick to iteration? The answer is that some problems are difficult to implement iteratively, but can be concisely and conveniently solved using recursion. The merge sort algorithm we introduced in one of our previous videos is a good example. Let's review it. In merge sort, we sort the left and right halves of the array separately, and then merge the two sorted subarrays into one sorted array. We recursively perform such operations to sort the entire array. Carefully observing the merge sort code, we can find that if you ignore the merge function, its recursive logic is extremely concise. Let's take a look at the pseudocode. First, we define the merge sort function hoping it can sort the elements in the L2 R-1 closed interval in A. Then, we need to consider the base case. When the number of elements to be sorted is less than or equal to 1, return directly. Next, we call the recursive function to sort the left and right subarrays separately. Finally, we call the merge function to merge the two sorted subarrays into one sorted array. Can we also implement merge sort through iteration? The answer is yes. The following code is the iterative version of merge sort. You can pause and take a closer look if interested. Although merge sort can be implemented in an iterative manner, the logic is very confusing, and boundary processing is often error prone. So for merge sort, recursion is more elegant and concise. Before we end today's video, I'll leave you with a question. In the Tower of Hanoi problem, there are three packs, A, B, C, and N disks on pack A. The size of the disks increases from top to bottom. Our goal is to move these n disks to pack C, just like this. There are two restrictions. One, we can only move one disk at a time. Two, after moving the disk, 
The larger disks cannot be placed on top of the smaller disks. How to solve the Tower of Hanoi problem recursively? You can think about it, and we'll explain it in the next video. That's all for today. If you like our videos, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave a comment down below. Thank you and see you next time.